When it comes to breeding and racing horses, the most important thing, in my opinion, is how the horses are fed. Hey, ladies, you guys looking for something to eat? Hey, huh? you guys hungry? You only get one chance when horses are, are young, when they're baby foals, weanlings, yearlings, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, to make sure their nutrition needs are met. When people come to the ranch and they look at my yearlings, most people comment and say, oh my goodness, they look like two-year-olds. They might even look like three-year-olds. They're big, they're stout, they're pretty, they're well fed. That's because of the nutrition. The most important nutrition for a horse is what you feed them for hay. That's why I feed Stanley hay. My yearling fillies, my yearling stud colts, they have as much access to the Stanley pellets as they possibly can. They also get pasture and they get time to run around and play and blow off that excess steam. But good quality alfalfa will make a young horse grow incredibly quick. Now, it doesn't make them grow that quick that it hurts their joints or their bones or anything like that, but it gives them the foundation of a good growth pattern. When horses are stunted when they're little and they don't get fed correctly, you can almost never make it up. So listen, mate, come with me as we talk about Stanley Height and why you need to feed it. I'm Clinton Anderson, and I have a method for training horses. Getting horses to behave is simple. It's training people that's the real trick. Join me as I tackle some of the most challenging situations with problem horses and with problem owners. What's going on, big fella? You waiting for some hay? Hmm? You hungry? You looking for something to eat, eh? Come here, big fella. You guys have seen Titan from the very beginning. And from a baby foal, he knows nothing but the Stanley feeding program. That's why he's big, he's strong, he's robust. A lot of you guys have been following Titan's training on the YouTube videos, and uh, he's coming along really well. But the only reason that he's mature the way he is is because of what we feed him. So over the last two and a half years, Titan's made a lot of change as well. Well, Stanley also believe in change. They've had a lot of innovation in the last four years. In fact, that was the last time I was up there. So listen, mate, let's head up there to Idaho. Let's see what Stanley are up to and what kind of innovation they're up to next. Come on. We chose Idaho because my family moved here a long time ago, so I didn't choose Idaho, but my, uh, my family definitely did. I worked for my grandfather doing hay for him, and then my father purchased 240 acres in the early 90s. That's where his home is today. The family grew up there. Since the early 1990s, we have expanded um, into multiple farms across southern Idaho. Today we farm 30,000 acres, mostly alfalfa and timothy grass. My dad has stepped down, but he still holds me accountable when things aren't right. I've taken on the role of CEO and president I have a leadership team that's been here a while. They're very passionate about the business. I can't say enough about those guys. At Stanley, quality is part of our value proposition, and that starts in the field, which is why we make the investments in the farmland to start our quality control and assurance 
right in the field with the planting of the seed. Uh, we feel like Idaho should be as well known for growing forages as it is potatoes because it, it does grow such high quality forage. Now, Idaho is a great area for raising alfalfa with its volcanic soils and the moisture we get. Most of our moisture is in the winter. Uh, it's pretty dry in the summer, so it's, it's very good for drying down the hay. And we have a lot of irrigation water out of the Snake River and the surrounding mountains from the snowpack. We started out focused in equine. That's, that's what started the business for us today. We feed all sorts of animals. We're focused on new products for chickens and goats, and we want to continue to grow and take care of the consumer that's got some backyard animals, and, and they're passionate about what they feed their animals. We invest in the right type of equipment and people to make sure that the forage is being cared for as it's going through the manufacturing process, all the way through distribution and to the retail shelf. Not all forage is grown the same, which is why we go out and we invest in additional land. And the consumers can know exactly where that forage came from to ultimately end up in their feed, in their barn. We brought Clinton up so he could pick out his own premium western forage and take it back to the ranch in, in Texas and have confidence for his animals. Dusty, how are you, mate? Hey, Clinton, doing good. Good to have you back. Well, it's good to be here, mate. It's been almost four years since I was up here in this beautiful country up here in Idaho. It's absolutely stunning. What are we up to today? What are you doing? Well, we'd like to uh, run you around the farms and uh, pick out some Stanley Premium Western Forage for you. So that's what you're doing right here. What kind of a field are we in right now, mate? This is uh, premium alfalfa here. Let me ask you this question, because people ask me this a lot, and I don't exactly have the right answer. I just know the quality is what I want, but I don't know the right exact technical answer. What makes the hay here in Idaho so much better than everywhere else? You know what I mean? Because that's what they'll say to me. Why do you ship it all the way from Idaho to Texas when you could get hay a lot closer? And I tell them it's because of the quality and the consistency. But is there a more technical answer of why you guys grow it up here? You bet. I mean, we have, you know, rich soils here. Our, our climate is just fit for the perfect forage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, our great employees, I mean, we take pride mm -hmm. throughout the company. So tell me, up here in Idaho, you've got, what, the right amount of rainfall, or how much rainfall do you get up here annually? We only get seven or eight inches of rain a year. The climate is just ideal for growing and harvesting premium western forage. How many did you just have in well, Texas, how in Texas today? We got about 15 inches in about three weeks in <laughs> yeah. spring. You know what I mean? It was bad. So if you get so little rainfall, obviously everything's got to be irrigated then. Yep, everything's under pivots, so we turn the rain on and off when we need to. So that's handy for then obviously cutting it and, and, and curing it and, and baling it, and you can control the atmosphere a little bit better. Yep. Very good. We're well, certainly a pretty field. I tell you what, what else up here could I do that would be a bunch of fun? Clinton, I know you ride a lot of horses down in Texas. We got something with a little more horsepower. What do you got in store for me up here, Mike? We, we got some swathers. Well, what the hell is a swather? Well, it uh, goes fast around these fields, and we get it all cut, put on the ground. So it's basically a big lawnmower? Yep. <laughs> and you're going to let me drive it? Absolutely. <laughs> sucker. Let's get out of here. <laughs> We've invested heavily in farm ground. We're uh, big believers in keeping it from field to shelf. So controlling the quality from the field all the way to the retail shelf for the end consumer in some cases is very important to us. So we continue to invest. We can control quality when we harvest on our own farms. We grow it, we bell it, store it. That's key for us. Go! It was a great opportunity for Clinton to be out with us. As we walked through that field, the soil was dry, the alfalfa was at the perfect maturity. It was great timing for him to be out there with us and, and be able to see it right before we cut it. 
Jason, I'd like to introduce you to Clinton Anderson. It's good yeah, to meet you, Mike. I'm the vice president of the, the ag division for the company. I handle all the planning, the irrigating, the harvest plans, and making sure we're getting the high quality out of all of our forage. Well, listen, Jason, what are we doing out here, Mike? Well, we're just checking to see if this field's ready to cut. Um, it's it's been dry and getting ready to go. We just checked it, and, and it's time. So what, what is good conditions for you to be able to cut up? Uh, we got to make sure the ground's dry. We shut yeah. the irrigation off about six days before we cut. Once the ground's dry and the and the, and the forage is ready to go, we, we get going. Good. What about these machines back here? So those are the swathers. That's what cuts it all down. Yeah. Um, that's what I understand you'll be operating for well, us today. Well, that's what he says. I yeah. think he's a fool for letting me do it, but <laughs> I'll have fun doing it. I'm a little worried. <laughs> yeah, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'll let you guys get going. Good deal. Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. I'll Good go deal. check some more fields. Right. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, mate. Yep. See you later. So these machines are going to take off now? Yep. Yeah, right. they're ready to go. When the fields are getting close to being ready to harvest, that's when it's real important that we're out there. Um, our farm managers know what to look for to know the right stage of growth when it's time to harvest it for the highest quality and consistency. Uh, once we make the decision it's time to harvest, we know how many days till harvest, so we, we shut the irrigation off, let the, let the field dry. You know, within five or six days, we get the equipment out there, we check it one more time. If everything looks good, we, we start cutting. So it's important that, the, that we have the ground dry before we cut the hay. So uh, when we cut it and set it on the ground, there's no moisture down there. It lets the hay dry faster. That way when we're ready to bale, keeps our quality high and, and that, that way we don't have any problems with mold. So Jason, what does it take to raise uh, premium forage? Well, it all starts with the perfect conditions when we plant. Uh, we right. spend a lot of time out making sure the fields are perfectly level. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you got to pick the right seed for the climate. You know, our, our farms are in different locations. Like where... this farm's about 4,000 acres, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so that's, exactly. that, is that a kind of a medium-sized farm for Stanley? That's about average for us. Okay. Yeah, it's four to 6,000 acres. Right. Yeah. right. The elevation makes a big difference here. We're at, at about 5,300 feet, so we got to pick the right seed mm -hmm. that'll handle the cold temperatures here. Mm -hmm. Other farms, we can pick one that, that can handle cooler temperatures but right. grows a little better. And... So you covered ground, getting the ground right. What else? So then, then we plant, you know, uh, got to plant it, and then we spend a lot of time just walking in the fields, checking them, uh, looking, making sure the seed's coming up right, irrigating right, got to keep the, the moisture perfect. So how, how often does each plant kind of get some moisture on it? Like, I see you've got this pivot behind us. How often are you watering, uh, you know, the field? Once a week, every 10 uh, days? They actually run almost constant until, until it's time to cut. Uh, we'll, you know, if it's cool, it'll start, uh, it'll start getting a little extra moisture in there, so we'll shut them down for a couple days, and then we fire them back up. And, keep them going until it's time to so cut So basically, by, by doing the pivot, you just can control the rain. It's ideal situation. Exactly. And then when yep. you cut, you know, you're cutting that water off and you can control everything again. So right. I can see why now Idaho is a, is a great place to raise honey. Right. Yeah, we get most of our moisture in the winter. So yep. in the summer, we can shut the water down, cut yep. the hay, let it cure naturally. Yeah. And, and it's just perfect conditions for, for great forage. Makes sense. So these machines are called swathers, is that correct? Correct, And that's yep. just a, a tractor that cuts hay, correct? Exactly. Like normal yep. tractor, my tractor, you can put different implements behind it. Right. This is just strictly for cutting hay. Exactly. Why yep. is that? Is it faster, more productive? Why don't you have a, a big mower behind a, 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 a um, tractor? It's mostly speed. These are, they cut a lot faster and very consistent. We okay. want every one of our machines to cut the hay exactly the same so it's consistent throughout every field. So what's the next step in this process, mate? So after we cut it, we got to let it dry. Mm -hmm. um, in our Idaho dry climate, it'll dry in about four days. Yes. And then we got to bale it. Bale it. Okay, very yeah. good. So when do I get to get in the tractor? Let's do it right now. Right now, I'm excited. <laughs> right now, Jason, this is the big moment. Yep, this is the one. It does make me nervous to have new operators in, in those machines. Um, they're pretty complicated to get used to. Oh, man. Comfy. Yeah. So you're yeah. going to sit in here and tell me what the hell to do, correct? Yep, exactly. Right on. Step one, mate. Yep. So put your foot on the pedal down here and pull that steering wheel towards you. So just a quick run down. This is what will move you forward and back. This side, it's a joystick, just yep. like that. You'll touch that one time. The front will go down. Once you get ready to go, touch that, and it'll go forward. Right up. You'll click this thing, the yellow one, pick it up, push it forward, and you'll hear everything turn on. I forgot most of it, but we'll figure it out as we go. As okay. we go. So how do we start this? And Where is there a break in case there's a problem? There, there's not. <laughs> so okay. if, if things go bad, turn the key off, and it's going to stop instantly. Right. It's probably going to hurt a little bit. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> but most of the time with new operators, we can. there is times we can have some issues. That's <laughs> making me nervous <laughs> as hell. I'm going to be honest.
What can I say? I'm a horse trainer. I'm certainly not a tractor expert, that's for sure. Okay, keep going forward. Yep, now just gotta go a little bit faster though. Faster. Yeah. Gotta try to catch up with those guys. Yeah, they took <laughs> off. I think they knew they were in danger. Yeah. Am I too far on the edge now? No, well, that's you're, all right. you're good. Now you can just, so it tells you right here your speed. Holy shit. I don't we're good. <laughs> Okay, that's plenty fast enough, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go any faster. Is this fast or slow for these machines? It's really slow. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I'm driving like a big fairy. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a big yes. Nancy boy. When I put my grandma in here, that's how fast she goes. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Because <laughs> normally I like speed, but i got to be honest, this machine, I can, I just can tell with my personality and stupidity <laughs> and a couple of drinks, I can get into trouble yeah. in a big way with this thing. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so these guys drive these swappers pretty much eight hours a day. Yep. Yeah, they got exactly. a radio in here, they got their lunch, they just drive along. Yep. I can yep. see how this could kind of be peaceful. Look how pretty it is out there. Yeah, yeah, they got radio, they got air conditioning, they're, they're just That's good to amazing. Go. Huh. They, they and have... do they always go together, like four together? Or... Yeah, four to, sometimes we have as many as ten. But they together. try to stay in line with each other, or that's the goal? Well, no, once we get going, they'll they'll kind of all go to their own section of the field. Right, okay. Um, we want to do one field at a time, so that whole field will dry together, then right. we'll move to the next field. Okay. So to keep the consistent quality and everything, we try to keep them you know, Yeah, they're all together. cutting at the same time, not like six hours apart. Correct? Right, yep. What was that? Yeah, <laughs> I think you hit a rock. We hit a rock. Yeah. Okay, but, okay. This is this is kind of fun. You kind of get used to it. I'm not going any faster though. But yeah. this is this is good. <laughs> kind of making it a bit of a mess here. Maybe we should uh, park this thing and go try yeah. balance. I day. think we should. <laughs> You've seen how bad I am. Yeah. Okay. How, how do we stop it? What do we so do now? Just pull back on the orange lever till it stops moving. Whoa, Nelly! Come to daddy. Thank okay. you. Yeah. It was fun, was fun and kind of kind of. Uh, Stressful all at the yeah, same time. Let's little, let's have a look back. Little crooked rails back yeah, there, yeah, not real good straight lines right there. I got to be honest. Yeah, we'll let the <laughs> professionals come clean it up. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yep. If our neighbors saw how Clinton had cut that field, we're going to be very embarrassed. Let me tell you, Dusty was lucky. I didn't wreck this thing. Check out our latest catalog from Down Under Horsemanship. It's filled with beautiful imagery and in-depth information on all the products used in this show. Visit our website or call this number and we'll send it to your door free of charge. After we cut the hay and let it sit out there for a few days, we'll check it. Um, once the top's dry, we'll rake it. And that's rolling two rows together to let the bottoms dry. And then let it sit for another day. And we go out and check for stem moisture is, is a bad thing. We don't want any moisture left in the stems of the plant. Once that's gone, we'll wait for dew at night. When the dew comes in, then we'll start belling. And the dew's important to help keep the leaves on the hay itself. If we bell too dry, they'll all fall off. So we wait till the perfect condition for belling to keep the leaves on there and keep the quality high. Our balers are set up with a, a tractor, and behind the tractor is the steamer, and then the baler. So something new we've added for this season is uh, steamers on our balers. It's a machine that, that adds steam right in front of the baler to help keep the leaves in the bell. It's used with just normal drinking waters, uh, just anything we would all drink. Um, it gets it hot, turns it to steam, and, and puts it on right in front of the baler. The operators, they know whether to stop or make adjustments. If the conditions aren't right, they'll call it a day. The best baling conditions for us are, it's gotta be when it's not too hot outside. Uh, the steamers, once it gets so hot, they can't keep up. And then at night, uh, it just, we can't get too much dew. So the perfect baling conditions would be late afternoon till about the middle of the night, and then early morning till it starts getting hot outside. After we bale, we get all the hay out of the field, we put it in the stack. Um, the farm managers go out and grade the hay. They check for quality, any issues that might happen during harvest. Um, and then after the farm managers check it, we put a grade on it, and then we have, have a second group of people that come in and check it again and set a reserve on it for a certain customer or a certain process within our company. So we're double checking everything to make sure that it is the right grade 
So after we grade the hay, uh, we decide whether it's going to stay on the farm till, till we use it later or if we're going to haul it into our facility. Um, either way, we do it right away. We get it stacked up and tarped within 24 hours to maintain the quality of the hay as it was the day we built it. Well, mate, I'm off to the Stanley factory to see what's new. Hi, guys, how are you? I'm very well. I'm Clinton, what's your name? Hi, Clinton, I'm Bob. Bob, good to meet you, and? I'm Brianna. Brianna, good to meet you nice guys. You. So, Bob, tell me, what do you do here, mate? Uh, Clinton, I'm the vice president of the Stanley Supply Chain. Very good, and, and Brianna, correct? Correct. What do you do here, mate? I do quality assurance for all of our finished products. So you're the lady that makes sure that my pallets and all my hay gets to me in good shape, is that right? Yep. Well, you do an excellent job, that's for sure. Well, listen, guys, it's been about four years since I've been here. What's new around Stanley Hay? Well, Clinton, we've put in some uh, really interesting, efficient machinery here, packaging equipment, some yep. inspection equipment, some conveying systems to make the plant run a little more efficient and arrive at that high-quality hay that Brianna discussed with you a little earlier. Very good. Are you going to be able to show me some of those machines today? Oh, absolutely. We'd Very good. So you're going to give me a tool, correct? We are. Great. Well, let's get started. Before we do, we got to get some safety equipment. Oh, uh, you do? You've got the good old safety equipment for you? So, a vest and some glasses. Ah, oh, sexy vest. I like it. <laughs> I like where your head's at. Okay, very good. And the glasses. So, I'm yep. going to put this on now? Yep. Right on. Clinton, this is our RPAC machine. This is the machine that, that wraps our compressed hay bales. Uh, for ease and convenience for the consumer. Okay, and this is new since the last time I was here, four years ago? This is new since you were here last. Okay, cool. So, Brianna, explain the idea of the plastic bag and what is this on top of it? So, there's a couple of the things with the plastic. Um, right. The first is, when this is on store shelves, without the green film on it, uh, the hay will tend to bleach from the store lights. So, the green film helps the hay to stay its natural color. Okay. It is also for the ease of the consumer. You can throw that in the back of your in your trunk, and you're not getting hay everywhere. Fair nice and clean. Um, and then this is the handle. You just pick it up and carry it right back. So you're ready to go. Yep, ready to go. Just grab and, it off the shelf. Has this been a big addition to the Stanley product line? It has. Um, we've been selling the compressed bales for a while, but then the wrap um, is fairly new. Okay, and being popular. It has. Very good. So Bob, where are we going to next, Mike? Well, Clinton, right across the. Right across the building here, we'll go to our Conchetti bagger machine. That's also new since you were here what last. What is it called? A Conchetti, a Conchetti bag. bagging machine. Okay. So, Bob, tell me about this machine, Mike. So this machine, Clinton, takes bags off of a roll, right. runs them through, forms them, fills them through a scale, seals them, and then yeah, sends them down the line to the palletizer behind it. Okay, and this is mainly designed for the alfalfa pallets, correct? Correct. What we're running today is alfalfa pellets, although this machine will run the beet pulp pellets, it'll run cubes of, of Timothy and alfalfa. So it's an all-purpose machine for our product line. So basically, if I'm if I'm understanding, you can run a lot more bags through this in the old system? Uh, quite a few more, right. yeah. And the bags are better, tougher, better sealed? You bet. More efficient, more consistency in the finished product. It sets the store shelf very well. Uh, and just, just better ease of, of use for our consumers. Like how many bags does this machine push out a day on average? So it can uh, run up to about 21 bags a minute, and it matches with the equipment behind it and the palletizing. Man, that's a lot. Huh, pretty neat. So, Brianna, what is this machine here, Mike? So this is our metal detector. So as the bags go through, it checks to make sure there's no metal, metal particles in these bags. Um, if there are metal particles, then this pushes out and pushes the bag off. Okay, help me out here. What would be metal in an alfalfa hay? You know what I mean? Uh, what, what, would be, what are the common things that could be in? Not common, but what could be in there? Well, the main thing that we worry about is any little particles from our equipment. Right, um, like the blade, the blade of a mower, anything like anything at all. And then even with our pelleter equipment, how the, the grinders and everything it goes through, I mean, there's always right. a chance that there could be a little fragment And there. Spe I spe you know, especially with a horse, has got 
you know, anything is sensitive. So you guys are picking up even, it'll pick up very fine particles? Very fine particles, yes. Oh, so people can be guaranteed when it gets through this machine, there is nothing in there that's going to hurt their horse. Right. That's pretty important. That's excellent. So after it goes through this, we weigh the bag. Right. Make sure we're getting our correct weight. Uh, they also do seal checks here, make sure the bags are completely sealed up. Right. Don't want any moisture or anything getting into these before they get to the consumer. OK. Um, and then we also check for the date code on the bottom of the bag. Um, that way, if we ever have any issues, we can trace back to when it was produced. Very good. So, Bob, what do we got going on here, Mike? The Clinton disc palletizer is matched up with the bagger. And what this does, this robot brings the bag off the conveyor belt onto the pallet in a very uniform and consistent way. And the great thing about this is, is that the machine is stacking these 40-pound bags as opposed to humans, so there is no risk of injury with this machine. Ron. Now, tell me, how many bags can this, this machine handle a minute? So it matches up with the bagging machine. It can run up to about 20 to 21 bags a minute. And very consistent. Once it does one side, then what, it goes to the other side? Yeah, that's right. And uh, the the layers uh, oscillate so that each each layer is locked in for shipment to our customers. So where do these pallets go from here? The so Clinton, after the pallets are ejected from the palletizer, they go down a conveyor belt where they're stretch wrapped and then finally ready for shipment to our customers. Can you show that to me? I will. Right on, head out. So Clinton, we were just uh, we just finished up looking at the packaging area. Right. Now we'll show you our finished goods sit down area. And what's important about this is that uh, we pack the stock and ship from our stock for orders to customers. So we have an assured supply of product for our customers. So we only stack our pallets too high. That way we ensure that we're not damaging any of the product by right. putting too much weight on them. Um, we saw that the pallets already got wrapped. Uh, do that nice and tight, make sure the bags don't shift, not, they don't get ripped or anything during transportation. Um, and then we also put pallet covers on them. This keeps them nice and clean. Make sure we're not getting any dust or anything else on them. That way our bags are arriving in perfect condition to the store shelf. And then where do these pallets go from here? On a truck, on a train? How do they get shipped out of here? Um, they can go on either. Uh, some of these we load into rail cars. They get shipped to our distribution centers and then get shipped out. Uh, some go into trucks and go straight to the stores. Um, it just depends on who they're headed to. So this product here, on average, how long does a product sit here before it gets shipped out to the consumer? Um, this is usually only here for about a week. A week, and then it's out the door. Right. So pretty much from the time it gets bailed to processed and out the door is a relatively short time period? Correct. We do a first-in, first-out inventory program, so we're shipping products uh, to be as fresh as they can be as they hit the store shelves. So that basically keeps the nutrient level up in the product. It's not sitting around for weeks and months on end. That's correct. That's the biggest thing I love about Stanley is the consistency. Everything I get, I used to get tired of getting different shipments of hay, and every shipment would be different. Every shipment would be different quality. The protein, the nutrients, et cetera, that's, that's one of the biggest things that I like about Stanley is that I know I get the same product all the time. Since 2012, we've made great improvements in our plant. We've uh, invested heavily in, in all sorts of items that help in quality and quality control. And we've also partnered with Dr. Duren. Dr. Duren coaches us through making great products for our customers. He's, he's very passionate about having the best for, for what the animal needs. Dr. Dern has helped us develop the Stanley Forage Finder to help simplify the complicated process of finding the right forage to feed your horse. And he's truly passionate about Stanley Premium Western Forage and passionate about the animals, so it, it's a great fit and it, it makes us better at the end of the day. As horse owners, we spend a great deal of time with our equine friends 
uh, both in competition, training, etc. And one of the things we often worry about is, are we feeding these horses correctly? And how do you really know? Well, there are several things that you can look at a horse, look at them visually, and you can tell, is my feeding program doing what it's supposed to be doing? And our, our subject here is a, a 24 year old mare. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit about body condition scoring, where you look at a horse and what that will tell you from a nutrition standpoint. So in body condition, you're looking at the overall fatness or thinness of the horse. And you're looking at different areas. We start and we look at the neck. A horse that has a big fat deposit associated with the neck, that's called a cresty neck. So we, we look at the neck, we palpate the neck, can we feel a fat deposit? Are we getting a big wobble, uh, a, a noticeable fat deposit in that area? Then we, we look at the, the shoulder area. Do we see the bones of, of the shoulder? Can you see the bony structure? That would be a horse, obviously, that, that's underweight. On the other hand, a horse that has globby or very soft spots on his shoulder, okay, is one that's carrying a lot of fat. Then we move back, we look at that, this area over the, the back, this is the area called the withers. Uh, horses that have a very pronounced wither are thin. Horses that, that the withers seem to disappear, those are horses that are gaining fat deposits over the top line of that particular horse. Then as we move back in the horse, then we look typically over the ribs. If you can see the ribs, if you can feel the ribs, indicating a horse that's thinner, if you're pretty sure your horse was born with ribs but haven't seen them or felt them in years, indicate that the horse is probably overweight. Then the next area is we look at the horse from behind. And if we can turn this horse around, we can, we can look at what we have here. What we're looking at is we're looking for any kind of bony protrusion associated with the hip. We're also looking for fat deposits on either side of the, of the horse's tail head. We don't want big fat deposits, and they often develop over time, so we, we don't want those to occur as well. So typically, a horse that's 24 years old, a, a mare that's, that's still active, we want those in a body condition score of somewhere between five and six. This horse, as it stands now, is in a body condition score of six. So this would be uh, optimum or slightly high optimum. But again, factoring in the age of the horse, uh, a body condition score of six is, is very acceptable. Now, in, in adjusting that body condition, either adjusting it up or down, depending on the horse, then we start talking about diet. And we start talking about making feed decisions. A, a horse this size, uh, this horse would probably weigh uh, about 1,050, maybe 1,100 pounds is where this horse would, would weigh. How much forage do you feed? How much do they need? This horse can comfortably eat 2% of his body weight. So that's somewhere between 20 and 22 pounds of dry forage a day. If we consider how much grain we would ever feed to a horse like this, the maximum amount of grain that we'd ever feed is less than half the amount that we'd have as forage. So forage is truly the, the big component of the diet. Another important component with forage is forage quality. Uh, horses do not have the ability to vomit. So they have a one-way digestive tract. What you put into that digestive tract has to go all the way through. If for a, instance, if we had something for breakfast that didn't agree with us, we can actually get rid of that. A horse, on the other hand, cannot. It's gotta go all the way through the digestive system. So feeding quality ingredient, quality forage, is very, very important. The other criteria with forage is the better forage that we provide, the higher calorie, the higher nutrient content of forage, and the better forage that we provide, the less grain that we need to find or feed to provide these horses with the additional calories. So forage truly is the key in, in feeding these horses. And again, it doesn't make any difference if you have uh, an endurance horse, a dressage horse, a jumping horse, uh, a, a reining horse. They all center around good quality forage at first. The better the forage, the less grain, the less digestive upset that you're going to have with these horses. So we have many forage options that you can choose. What's the best forage for horses? And that's something that's debated worldwide. Do I feed an alfalfa type forage? Do I feed a grass type forage? Do I feed some sort of mix of different forages? And, and those choices are, are all available to, to, to horse owners. You can select the forage. 
typically, I would like to think that we select forage based on the nutrient requirement of the horse. In other words, our higher calorie, higher protein forages are designed for horses that have the higher nutrient requirements. Unfortunately, a lot of the forage choices that people make are based on what's regionally available to them. Okay? But now that we're able to buy good quality forage, it, it's not something you just buy from a farmer. It's something that you can get in a retail store. We have the ability to change the forage component of the diet and make progress with feeding that particular horse. So this horse, 24 years old, okay, they're starting to lose some of their digestive efficiency. Because they're losing some of that digestive efficiency, maybe they need a higher nutrient quality hay. So this horse normally, uh, if it were 10 years younger, would probably be on primarily a, a grass-based forage. Uh, in this particular situation where we're getting some aging, we will go to a higher alfalfa type forage, a higher nutrient, higher protein, higher energy calorie value for the forage. With so many different forages available that we can feed to horses, how do we determine which forage is actually the best choice for our horse? Oftentimes, as equestrians, we rely on the advice of, of trainers. We re rely on the advice of other people in the barn of, of which forage selection is actually the, the best for our horse. But at Stanley Premium Western Forage, we've actually developed some tools that we've put on our website that actually help determine which forage is the best for your horse. So we have the, the forage finder, and that forage finder allows you to put in questions or to answer questions about your horse and then it gives you forage choices which would be nutritionally appropriate for that particular horse. And that's very handy in determining uh, which forage is best for your horse. Am I feeding the, the correct forage to, to my horse? The other tool we have on there is we have a feed calculator. And what this does is this allows you, if you switch to a higher quality forage, if you go with one of the Stanley Premium Western forages with a higher nutrient content than local haze, it allows you to calculate how much feed you would save, how much grain you would feed, how much less grain you would feed when you're feeding Stanley Premium Western forage. These are just two tools we put on the website to help horse owners make informed decisions about feeding their horses. Don't forget to check out our next training session with Titan and the Method. We look forward to expanding our relationship with Clinton. Uh, it's, it's been very good so far, and, and we look forward to working with him well into the future. Stanley has been a big part of my uh, business now for probably about the last six years. Um, my horses rely on it. Like, you know, my, I, I'm, I'm absolutely fanatical about my horses being healthy and fat and, and looking good and great hair coat. And, uh, and Stanley's a, a huge part of that. You know, obviously ADM is as well, and Smart Pack, and, and the three companies all work on my horse's nutrition. But the foundation of my horse's diet is Stanley products, okay? I'm always amazed of the quality or lack of quality of hay that people feed to their horses, and the same people complain that their horses are underweight, their horse's hair coat don't look good, they're not sh shiny, they're not slick, fat, etc. Gordon McKinley, my mentor in Australia, he always used to tell me, you know, I always noticed Gordon's as a kid, I always noticed his horses were really shiny and bloomed and were really healthy looking and, and just the perfect amount of weight. But, and I noticed he never used to brush them a lot because I always thought that brushing them is how you got a horse real shiny. And he said to me, he said, Clinton, I brush them from the inside out. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I feed my horses the very best quality feed I can. And when you feed your horse the best quality uh, feed, and you make sure that they're dewormed and they have no parasites, they naturally bloom on the outside. And he was dead set right. He told me that, oh, I don't know, close to, you know, probably 20, 27 years ago now, okay? 
And I still believe that. My horses shine on the outside because I want to put on the inside, and Stanley is a big part of that. Well, Mike, this looks pretty good. How are hey, you, big fella? How are you doing? Good to see you. Good it's to great see you. to be here. Yeah. Man, did you pr prepare some food for us? You bet, man. <laughs> got some. Uh, what do you got here? Tenderloin and tri tip. That's amazing. Well, listen, you took care of us four years ago when we were up here, and you're taking care of us again. The company looks great, mate. You should be very, very proud of what Stanley's accomplished, and I'm very proud to be a part of what you're doing here. It's well, I appreciate that. Appreciate really, that. It really has. All jokes it's aside, my horses have never looked, never looked as good as they have. Good. Yeah. We're glad to hear that. Well, listen, we're going to have a couple of drinks tonight. We're going to enjoy each other's company and, uh, and have a good time. We started with Clinton in 2012. The partnership's been been great. Clinton has a very high standard in his training and, and a lot of passion for his animals. We carry that, that same passion for what we do in delivering a premium product to our consumers. We're involved with Clinton at his tours, his ranch rallies. We're always trying to come up with ideas to work with Clinton that, that are effective in the marketplace and, and are meaningful to our consumers. At Stanley, we strive to exceed consumer expectations by having high quality, readily available, convenient products all throughout the United States. So no matter if you're in the Northeast or in the Southwest, you'll find the same quality product at the retail shelf. We have an extensive distribution network uh, across the West that we feed out of our direct plants here in Idaho. We have three distribution centers on the East Coast, which allows us to deliver our products to consumers on the East Coast, which is very important to us. What that means to the consumer is that they can find our product no matter where they're at in the United States and they can assure that the quality is going to be the same whether they buy it in the Northeast or in the Southwest. Stanley has built its reputation by providing high quality forage to the equine industry and the company continues to innovate new products and new ideas, forage based ideas. I think the things that make us really align well with Stanley is that we're both fanatical about quality. Okay, it's not quantity, it's quality. I, I don't want a horse leaving my ranch unless it's trained with the method the right way. I don't want my performance horses going to a horse show unless they look and feel and train their best. Stanley do not want one bag of pallets, one bale of hay, anything to go out their door unless it is the highest quality. That's what I respect about them the most, is that they're absolutely fanatics about quality. I, I've been up there during their quality control and what they've rejected sometimes, I'm like, that wasn't that bad. And they're like, no, it, it wasn't perfect. And that's what they're looking for. And that's why I like to be aligned with companies that have the same values as me. Part of our value proposition of bringing quality to the consumer starts at the field level, all the way from growing the crop in the field, through the plant, through the packaging and distribution to the retail shelves. By the time it ends up in the consumer's barn, they have that same high quality product just like it started out in the field. You got a drink here? Well, let's have a toast. Cheers. All right, here you go. To Stanley and down under horsemanship. Thanks, Mike. Here you go. Cheers. I tell you what, Mike, after the long day I've had, I would. this is really going down well. Yeah, I should have started about an uh, hour earlier. <laughs> Better late than never. Better yeah. late than never. Yeah. <laughs>